As we continue to look to God's Word this morning together, we'll begin with Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, and then we'll turn to uh, Hebrews chapter 4, where we'll find our text, our sermon text this morning. Uh, I remind you this is God's inspired, inerrant, and infallible Word. It deserves your careful attention. Genesis chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed and all their hosts. By the seventh day, God completed his work, which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work, which God had created and made. Hebrews chapter 4 Verses 3 through 8 is our text. I'm going to read uh, verses 7 through 11 of chapter 3. So if you'll look first at Hebrews 3, verses 7 through 11, and then we'll turn and begin chapter 4, verse 1. Hebrews 3, verse 7, Therefore, just as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me in the day of trial in the wilderness, where your fathers tried me by testing me and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was angry with this generation and said, they always go astray in their heart, and they did not know my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest." Chapter 4 and verse 1, therefore let us fear if while a promise remains of entering his rest, any one of you may seem to to have come short of it. For indeed, we have had good news preached to us just as they also, but the word they heard did not profit them because it was not united by faith in those who heard. For we who have believed enter that rest, just as he has said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has said somewhere concerning the seventh day, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again, in this passage, they shall not enter my rest. Therefore, since it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly had good news preached to them failed to enter because of disobedience, he again fixes a certain day today, saying, through David, after so long a time, just as has been before, today, If you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, he would not have spoken of another day after that. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Amen. Amen. Be seated, please, as we turn to our hymn of preparation for the preaching of God's word. Trinity Hymnal 303.
Amen. Amen. Let's pray and ask God's blessing on the preaching and the hearing of his word. Indeed, O oh God, we have gathered to worship you, to sing praise to your name, to pray to you. We've chiefly gathered, O oh Lord, to hear from you, to hear from your word. And as we come now to the centerpiece of Christian worship, to the preaching and hearing of your word, we pray, O oh Father, that you would be pleased to use it. We believe that the gospel is your power for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. We believe the promises that you've given concerning your word, that it never returns to you void without accomplishing all that for which you send it forth. We believe, O Lord, the promises that you've given concerning your spirit, that the spirit attends the word, that the spirit leads us into all your truth. And we confess our need for the Holy Spirit now and ask that you would grant us of the Spirit liberally in our hearts that we may know your word and that we may be doers of your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As frail human beings, we all know our need for rest. Some of us who are more frail know better than others our need for rest, for physical rest. It's uh, constantly before us, we could say. We, we're constantly reminded uh, that we need rest. Everyone needs the rest that sleep supplies. Students need a respite from their studies. God has designed a, a day of rest uh, that we might rest from our labors. And what's true of the body physically is also true of the soul. Our souls need rest. David, in Psalm 51, recognizes the need for soul rest. He recognized that his sin was always before him. He says, I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Now, you may never have thought about forgiveness of sin as a, a spiritual rest, but that's exactly what it is. It's a spiritual rest that God gives. He lifts the burden of our sins from us and gives us rest from that sin. In these past weeks, we've been dealing with this long exhortation here in Hebrews chapters 3 and 4 uh, that begins with a quotation uh, from Psalm 95, verses 7 through 11, which we read this morning in the context of, uh, of chapter 3. It begins with uh, God calling Israel, uh, God calling uh, those who, who hear, the Holy Spirit calling those who hear, uh, to consider uh, the negative example of, of Israel in the wilderness, the wilderness generation, and not to harden their hearts against God, uh, not to harden their hearts in sin, not to be those who whose hearts are hardened by the deceitfulness of sin, uh, chapter 3 and verse 13, exhorts us. Uh, last uh, Lord's Day, we began looking at verses 1 and 2 here in chapter 4, and the fear of not entering into God's rest. Uh, these first two verses, we said, can be summarized with three words, fear, promise, failure. We're being exhorted here uh, to, to be concerned about missing out on this promised rest. Uh, and we're reminded here that that rest remains. Uh, that's what the, the, the context of our text today says here in verses 1 and 2, that 
uh, that, that, uh, that that promised rest still stands. It still remains to be entered into. And then we're reminded, of course, that Israel failed to enter into that rest. Now, what does the writer mean when he tells the, uh, the readers that uh, the promise of entering God's rest still remains? Uh, well, we pointed out last week that uh, the concept of rest has taken on a broader concept than simply uh, the rest that God offered Israel in the land of Canaan. God offered them uh, safety and security and, and prosperity in the land. And uh, he's speaking of rest again here, but uh, we, we, we know that it must, it must be a broader than that. Uh, that the concept of rest includes not merely uh, a physical rest for Israel in the land, but also a spiritual rest for uh, the original hearers of the Hebrews and a, and a spiritual rest for us. So the text that we're dealing with is, is, is speaking to us concerning a, a spiritual rest for those who will enter in to that rest. It's a spiritual safety. It's a spiritual security. It's a spiritual prosperity. And the writer has nothing less in mind than the eternal salvation rest of our souls. And what our text teaches us here uh, today in, in chapter 4, verses 3 through 8, is that God offers present soul rest through faith in Jesus Christ, founded upon his own eternal rest, that he beckons believers to fully enter into his rest, and he urgently calls unbelievers to enter that rest. Now, I know that's a lot. I'll repeat it. God offers present soul rest through faith in Jesus Christ, founded on his own eternal rest, beckons believers to fully enter into that rest, and calls unbelievers to enter his rest. We're going to look at three things this morning in our text. The way of entering the soul's present rest, the foundation of the soul's present rest, and the urgency of entering the soul's present rest. The way of entering the soul's present rest, the foundation of the soul's present rest, and the urgency of entering the soul's present rest. Our text speaks first about the way of entering the soul's present rest. After telling us uh, in verse 1 that a rest remains, the author of Hebrews confidently asserts, we who have believed enter that rest. The text doesn't say that we shall enter that rest. That's a very great truth. It's a, it's a wondrous truth, but it's not the truth that's being taught here in the text of verse 3. The writer doesn't use the future tense, we will enter, but, the, but the, the present tense, we who have believed enter, thereby affirming that God's promised rest has become a present reality for those who believe in this present life. All who are believers in Jesus Christ are already uh, enjoying these, this rest. They've already entered into this rest and to some degree are enjoying that rest. The, the degree to which they're enjoying that rest depends upon the exercise of their faith. The proportion of their faith determines the, the, the degree to which they enjoy God's rest. So this is a present rest. It's not the future rest that, that uh, the, the Scripture speaks about in heaven. 
the glorious rest, eternal rest, uh, the, the, the perfect rest uh, throughout all eternity. It's a, it's a present rest. The, the writer here isn't, isn't aiming to detract from that future rest to the full realization of the believer's eternal rest in heaven, but to emphasize that we enter into rest now by faith, even though we don't yet have that rest in the fullest sense of its realization. Now, Jesus taught his disciples this in uh, the prelude to the high priestly prayer that we have in John chapter 17. And verse 3, Jesus said to them, this is eternal life, that you know God and that you know me. This is eternal rest, that you know the true God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. We experience, Jesus says, we experience eternal life now in this, uh, in this life. And we who have believed know God now. We experience this rest now as long as we keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. We experience that rest, this present soul rest that God has promised, and ultimately we will realize that rest fully, eternally. What does this rest mean? consist of? In what sense does God give rest to his believing people? Well, I've already alluded to uh, one of the primary ways that God gives us rest uh, in this life and, and this world, and that is by removing from us the burden of our sins. We experience God's rest through the forgiveness of of our sins. It, 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 this, this rest consists of forgiveness of sins and acceptance with God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. The believer rests from uh, the, the guilt of sin because he knows that his sins are laid upon Jesus Christ. Children, you uh, remember the account of the scapegoat in the book of Leviticus. You know what a scapegoat is, children. It's, a, it's, a, it's someone who takes the blame for someone else. Someone else is really to blame, but the scapegoat takes the blame. And in Leviticus uh, chapter 16, in, in the ceremonial law, uh, we're told about a ritual that uh, the uh, heir and the priest was to carry out in the, in the presence of God's people, where uh, two goats were uh, brought before the Lord, the text says there in Leviticus 16. And a lot was to be cast. And one of the scapegoats, uh, the, the scapegoat that was chosen, was, was, uh, was slain, was sacrificed as a sin offering. And the other goat was to be set free in the wilderness, was to be left to roam around in the wilderness. That was the scapegoat. And Israel was to know, Israel was to recognize that their sins had been placed upon the scapegoat. Literally, the goat of removal is what the Hebrew text says. When Israel thought of uh, the goat wandering around in the wilderness, they were to think of their sin as gone. As a young Christian, I sang a chorus. I don't remember the name of the chorus, but it began with the words, gone, gone, 
gone, gone. Yes, my sins are gone. Now my soul is free and in my heart's a song, buried in the deepest sea. Yes, that's good enough for me. I will live eternally. Praise God, my sins are gone. We don't have a scapegoat anymore. The ceremonial law has passed away. But we have a greater sacrifice than the goat that was offered for the sin offering. We have a greater sin bearer than the goat that, was, uh, that roamed uh, the wilderness. And when we think of the cross and when we think of Jesus, we need to think about that word gone. Our sins are gone. It no longer uh, rests upon our shoulder. It's been, uh, the guilt of, this, of our sin has been removed. It's been placed on Jesus Christ. He is our substitute. He is our, uh, he's the one who's taken the blame from us upon himself on the cross of Jesus Christ. Spurgeon is uh, so wonderful to read. If, if, if you've not read Spurgeon's sermons uh, or any of his works, I highly commend them to you. And I can't, I could paraphrase this, but I won't. Um, Spurgeon says concerning this idea that our sins are gone, he says, this is, this is a, uh, this is us recognizing, knowing that nothing can be in two places at one, at one time. The believer concludes that his sins were laid on Christ. They cannot be laid on him, and thus he rejoices in his own deliverance from sin through its having been imputed to a glorious substitute. The believer in Christ sees sin effectually punished, in Jesus Christ, and knowing that justice can never demand two penalties. It can't demand two penalties for the same crime or two payments for the same debt. The believer rests perfectly at peace with regard to his past sins. Christ, by suffering in our place, has answered the demands of justice And believers are at perfect rest in their souls. That is the soul rest. That's the soul's present rest that the writer to the Hebrews speaks about here in our text. The Shorter Catechism sums up the soul's present rest when it speaks of uh, the benefits that accompany our justification, adoption, and sanctification. The assurance of God's love, peace of conscience, joy in the Holy Spirit, increase of grace, and perseverance therein to the end. And so as we come to the end of this first point, I must ask, do you have this soul rest? Are you resting in Christ for your salvation? Uh, Do you know that your sins are gone? And is uh, your faith growing in the extent of this rest? Uh, Is your, your faith growing by proportion so that proportionally you more and more uh, enjoy this present rest, that it's increasing? That's the way of the soul's present rest, belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. Secondly, the foundation of the soul's present rest. The writer to the Hebrews goes on to say that uh, the believer's rest is founded upon God's own rest. That rest that we read about this morning in Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. The next sentence here, Uh, in our text, in verse 3. 
anticipates uh, the, the question when it says, although his works were finished from uh, the foundation of the world, it, it anticipates uh, this question, what is God's rest? And he explains that rest, uh, the writer to the Hebrews, that is, explains that rest by going on to quote uh, in verse 4 that he has said somewhere concerning the seventh day and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. Now, this is the second time that the writer to the Hebrews has, has made a vague reference to Scripture. The first time was in chapter 2 and verse 6. Uh, where he says, but one has testified somewhere, saying, what is man that you remind him, uh, that you remember him rather, or the son of man that you are uh, concerned about him. Now, we know uh, uh, the informed biblical reader knows that that's a quote from, uh, from Psalm 8, and the informed biblical reader knows that, that the quote that the writer of the Hebrew introduces here, for he has said somewhere concerning the seventh day, uh, that's a quote from Genesis chapter 2. It's a quote from uh, the creation account. But he does this because the reference isn't as important at the wor- as the words. Uh, the, he, he wants to focus our attention on these words. And God rested on the seventh day from all his works. After the world was created, the author reminds us, God initiated a period of rest. God rested from his work of creation at the conclusion of the sixth day. It wasn't a temporary state, uh, but God's continuing state of rest. And each of the six days of creation ends with the words, you will remember there was evening and there was morning and the first day, the second day, third, and so on until the sixth. For the seventh day, these time markers are missing. They're absent from the text. With the seventh day, this period of God's rest began. Unlike the Six days of creation, the seventh day doesn't end. It goes on forever. But rest for God doesn't mean idleness. God continues his work of uh, salvation. Uh, he continues his work. Remember, the, the, our, our catechism teaches us this, that uh, God uh, carries out his decrees in the works of creation and providence. So when God rested from creation... Uh, he, he began his work of providence. Uh, he sustains the world. He governs the world. Uh, he continues his work in the souls of men and women and boys and girls. Uh, we know this uh, because Jesus answered the Jews when they challenged him concerning his healing on the Sabbath day. My father is working until now. And I myself am working. So God rested from his works of creation. He rested from the work of creation, but he continues to work in his providence, and he continues the work of salvation. Uh, He continues to work this present rest of the soul in those who believe in Jesus Christ. And by those words, Jesus was indicating that God continues that work of redemption. So to enter God's rest means to enter into a saving relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ. God's rest is the foundation of our soul's rest because His work in our lives is sovereignly established, as the writer uh, proclaims in verse 3, his works were finished from the foundation of the world. Entering into God's rest means entering into his sovereign promise that he who began a good work in you will complete it to the end. 
that God is at work in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. And what does that mean practically for the one who's entered into that rest through faith in Jesus Christ? It means that you've put your faith in the sovereign God who, who has promised to save those who trust in Jesus Christ and that you can rest in his promises for you. It means that just as God rested from his work, so we rest from our works. We rest from uh, law works, as they're often called. We stop striving to enter that rest by our own doings. And we enter into our soul's present rest by faith. It means we can stop being concerned about whether or not we'll go to heaven if we're resting in Jesus Christ for our salvation. It means we can stop worrying whether we'll persevere as Christians because it's a sovereign work that God is doing, and we're, we're resting in that sovereign work. It means you can face the prospect of loss, of life, of suffering, and even death. Because ours is the God who has entered into his sovereign rest, the one who has established his purposes from the beginning and will carry them out until the end. The soul that enters God, God's rest fully trusts in his power and his control over all things. This is what you enter into spiritually by faith. And this is what you forfeit if you do not believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. And like Israel of old, the writer to the Hebrews says, you will not enter God's rest. Jesus calls out, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me. My yoke is easy. My load is light. But you shall find rest for your soul. Jesus offers rest from the burden of your sins, which he takes off of your back and puts on his uh, at, the, at the cross rest from the troubles of this world. Remember that he said to the disciples, these things I've spoken to you that in me you might have peace. Peace is, peace of conscience is such a great part of, of that rest. But he went on to say, in this world you will have tribulation. But what else did he say to those disciples whose hearts were fearing? He said to them, he said to these who were so concerned uh, that their Savior had told them that he was going away, he said to these uh, disciples, the 12 apostles who uh, were concerned that their Lord was going to die, uh, he said, be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. So entering into our present soul rest means that we recognize that God's grip is strong enough such that no one can snatch us out of his hand. It's saying with the Apostle Paul, for I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. It's a wonderful truth, is it not? It's a wonderful rest that God gives to us in our souls. Canaan was a picture of that rest. God pictured 
uh, the, the safety, the security, the prosperity of heaven itself in the land of Canaan. But he also pictures our pilgrimage to our heavenly rest in this life because Israel went to war when it entered the promised land. And so we enter into war when we enter into this rest. In all of our lives, is this not true, Christians? All of our lives is spiritual warfare. We're in it. We're engaged in it. And yet God promises us uh, this rest along the way, all along the way of our journey. God promises to give us rest. Jesus promised that you will have rest for your souls. The way of entering the soul's present rest, faith in Jesus Christ, the foundation of of the soul's present rest, uh, God's own rest on the seventh day. And then lastly, the urgency of entering the soul's present rest. Uh, the, The Holy Spirit, remember, is speaking these words. He spoke them to David uh, when uh, David wrote Psalm 95. He spoke them to the the readers of the the letter to the Hebrews, uh, and he speaks them to us. And the Holy Spirit is urging the reader of this long exhortation contained in Hebrews chapter 3 and 4 to enter into the soul's present rest. And he does so by a combination of promise and threat. It's very covenantal, isn't it? The, the covenant is, uh, contains promises. It also uh, uh, contains stipulations. Uh, it contains threats. So by quoting Psalm 95, verses 7 to 11, in chapter 3, verses 7 to 11, He introduces to us the negative example of the wilderness generation's failure to enter God's rest because of their unbelief, warning them, threatening them, threatening the reader of Psalm 95 in in that day, threatening the reader of Psalm 95 quoted in this letter to the Hebrews, threatening us today, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me in the wilderness. And today becomes that drumbeat of of this long exhortation. Today, 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 he says. Do you you sense the urgency uh, with uh, the the writer is speaking? Uh, He says it again in verse 13, uh, but encouraging one another day after day as long as as it is still called today, so that none of you, will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. And then in verse 15 again, quoting Psalm 95, today, if you hear uh, his voice. And then having urged them to enter into uh, their soul rest in chapter 4 and verse 1 by uh, by assuring them that the promise uh, still remains, he does so again in verse 6 of our text. Therefore, since it remains for some to enter, uh, followed by that same drumbeat, he again fixes a certain day today, saying through David, after so long a time, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. And then again in verse 8, he implies that a rest remains because Joshua didn't provide this soul rest. So God spoke of another day after that. We noted last week that the fear of not entering into God's rest, to which the writer calls his hearers in verse 1, isn't a fear that negates the promise that a rest still remains, that the promise of rest still stands. Just as uh, uh, God's promise doesn't lose its validity, so the threat doesn't lose its validity either. And so the writer repeats that quote from Psalm 95, 11, in verse 3, as I swore 
In my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. And again, in verse 5, they shall not enter my rest. These are words that, that applied not merely to Israel's experience in the wilderness, not merely to the wilderness generation, not merely to the, the reader of Psalm 95 in that generation, and not merely to the, the original readers of the letter to the Hebrews, but to us as well. Today, do not harden your hearts. Today, today, today is the drumbeat, and there's another drumbeat that comes alongside it. I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. And the, the point here isn't just to reiterate unbelieving Israel's failure to enter into that rest, but to emphasize to us the reality that the rest that was offered to Israel in the wilderness, the, the rest that was offered to David's hearers in Psalm 95, the rest that was offered to, uh, to uh, the readers of uh, Hebrews in uh, the day it was written, and to us today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as the wilderness generation did. God offers a present soul rest through faith in Jesus Christ, founded upon his own eternal rest, beckons believers to fully enter into that rest and urgently calls unbelievers to enter that rest. At this very moment, that rest remains. What, what should you do if you're not resting? What if you can't sincerely say, I have entered this rest. My soul is at rest. Well, your response shouldn't be despair. It should be to make a point to ask yourself, why can't I say this? Why can't I say that I have entered into rest? Is it because I haven't believed? Well, then the question to you is, why not? What's preventing you? Have you refused God's way of entering into that rest by faith? Is it because you're Instead of entering into that rest by faith, you're trying to clean up your life, clean up your act to make yourself presentable to God as though somehow uh, you could do that, as some, somehow by your own efforts you could make your way to heaven. Is it because you're trying to make moral improvements, uh, find your salvation by your own doing? If that's the case for you, friend, you'll never enter this promised rest. As you think of that soul rest, it's good to think of two prominent mountains in the scriptures. One is Mount Sinai, which you may know the, uh, upon which you may know the, the law was, was given to Moses, given to uh, his God's people, Israel. The other is Mount Calvary, where the Lord Jesus Christ was crucified for the sins of his people. And you must consider those two mountains, Sinai and Calvary. Those who attempt to find their rest by climbing Mount Sinai will not find that rest when they reach the summit. But Mount Calvary is an easier climb. And if you climb that mountain, you'll find a cross at the top of it. And if you believe in the one who was nailed on that cross, you will indeed enter into eternal rest. 
If you can genuinely say, by believing I've entered my rest, be thankful. This is a great privilege. If you can say, I have trusted in Christ and I'm continuing to trust in Christ, thank God. What a tremendous blessing that is presently to the soul. It's a wondrous display of God's sovereignty to those who are so unworthy to enter into this rest. But can you say, I ask, I'm living in the light of this rest, that I'm living my life in the knowledge that this rest has been giving, given to me, that uh, my present soul rest is feeding me, it's, it's nourishing me as I live out my life. If you can't say that, if you can't say that you're living in the reality of this rest experientially, make it a point to ask yourself, am I living in or clinging to sin? That's keeping me from that rest. Am I refusing to forsake my sin instead of hating it and forsaking it, uh, loving sin and treating it as your little darling? You must get rid of that sin that's blinding you. That's keeping you from, uh, from throwing off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles in this life. And running with perseverance, the race marked out for you. There's uh, an interesting uh, prospect, is it not? Running a race while resting. We have to run our race fixing our eyes on Jesus. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wonderful contrast. Ask yourself, am I trusting in myself to commend me to God? In other words, am I trusting in my own uh, performance as a believer to please God? Uh, we know that we're, we're to live as pleases God, uh, but we don't put our faith, we don't put our trust, we don't rest in, in our performance, our ability to carry out God's commands. We put our rest, we put our trust in Jesus Christ alone. So seek to rid yourself of everything that robs you of the simplicity of faith in Jesus and Jesus alone. Uh, res resolve in your heart to set everything straight uh, as long as it is still called today, so that you can genuinely say uh, that you have believed and entered into God's present rest and are more and more experiencing that rest as you make your way to the celestial city, to the promised rest that God holds out eternally to every believer in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, you are such a great God, and we are so unworthy of the rest that you offer and the rest that you give to those who have put their trust in Jesus Christ. Pray for any who uh, are listening to this sermon today by whatever me means of media here today or, or uh, through the various means by which this sermon is, uh, is, is distributed. We, we pray, O oh Lord, that uh, you might convict them of sin and you might drive them to Christ and that they might enter in to this present soul's rest. We pray for uh, those who, who are indeed genuinely converted and have entered into, that, into the rest that you, uh, you have provided. Lord, we, we pray that you would work in us. Uh, we are so often beaten down by 
the things of this life and discouraged and even uh, stand at the threshold of despair at times because we're not looking to your sovereign hand and the sovereign work that you have done in our redemption. O oh Lord, fix our eyes upon Jesus as we continue our spiritual warfare, as we make our way to the heavenly city, to our eternal state of rest. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.